The next session is, uh, we're kicking off um, with something um, that is incredibly relevant for all of you, uh, fungicide performance. Um, and uh, I'm going to hand over to Paul Gosling, who leads this project for us in AHDB. Thank you, Susanna. I'm going to cover two areas of our work this morning. I'm going to talk, first of all, about our fungicide performance work. And that's really int intended to allow you to design programs to optimise your disease control. We don't do work on fungicide programs. There are plenty of other people out there in the industry doing that. We look at single actives, as you'll see in a while. The second area of work I'm going to talk about is our fungicide resistance work. And that's really about helping you adapt the programs that you provide to your growers, your customers, to help minimise the de development of resistance to fungicides. And the output from that work goes into our three uh, main guides on the on three main crops. So we have our wheat disease management guide, our barley disease management guide. We don't actually have a disease management guide for oil straight, we just have a general guide, but all the information goes into that guide. So fungicide performance. So it, what's it all about? Well, its, its main selling point is the fact that it's independent information. As I say there's plenty of information out there from the ag chem companies about how their products work. Um, plenty of information you can see which may not be entirely um, fairly um, trialling products against one another. But we, this is independent information, we're not selling anything. And because of that, it's very popular with the levy payers. It's our second largest spend after the recommended list. We spend a little under £400,000 a year on this project. Um, our aim is to trial leading products side by side in a fair and transparent way. We have um, collaboration with the agrochemical industry on this. They, they uh, provide us with products before registration, while well, they're still in development in many cases, which means we can have a good, robust, robust data set on new products once they come to market. We try to stick to a standard format, which makes it easy to understand, and I'll go through that a little bit. And because it's been going for a long time now, we have a unique long-term data set. Obviously, the ag chems have all this sort of data, but this is in the public domain. Um, no one else really has this sort of data set in the public domain. So the project is managed um, by um, a group of companies, ADAS, NIAB TAG, SIUC up in Scotland, Harper Adams, and also Chugas, which is kind of the Irish equivalent of ADAS. And it's independent, as I've already said, from the agrochemical companies and the distributors, although we do co uh, collaborate with them um, in terms of supplying uh, products for us. It's overseen by the Fungicide Working Group. And the aim of that group is to provide scientific input, so making sure what we're doing is scientifically robust. They select products uh, guided by some um, rules we have about what can and can't be included, scrutinise the data, and then develop key messages from that data. The trials are run by our contractors. We don't do any trials ourselves. But all the data analysis is done in-house at HDB, um, so we have control of the data. And then the knowledge transfer messages are developed by HDB in, in collaboration with the project partners and the fungicide working group. And this project or group of projects <coughs> has been going for a long time now, I say, and it's become quite commercially sensitive. It's become, um, I would say, the gold standard in the industry, but the agrochemical companies recognise it has quite a lot of influence on what growers do. And we have to be very careful with it because of that commercial sensitivity. The trials themselves. Um, the wheat trials are the longest, um, they've been going since 1994. We have five septoria trials, they're just a single um, application, it's not a program, as I say we don't do programs, it's either a T1 or a T2 spray, um, and we also collaborate as I said with Chuggas, and they do a, a, a trial on our behalf, uh, using their money but our protocol. We have a single yellow rust trial per year, a single brown rust trial, and in 2015 we started work on a head blight trial. Now, that trial, I have to say, hasn't gone very well this year. We're still learning with that trial, and actually the data from that um, trial won't be shown this year. I say we're still learning with that. Barley has been going since 2002. We have two Rinkosporium trials, and then Chugas in Ireland run one on our behalf, um, targeting Rinko. We have two Netblot trials, a Mildew trial, and a Rambularia trial. Orsi Drape is the most recent trial series. And we have three light, light, light leaf spot trials, again, one done by Chugas. Uh, two FOMA and two sclerotinia trials. As you can see from the map, um, the trials are sp spread around the country aiming to get the most disease susceptible areas so we get good development on these, uh, disease on these trials. The trial design is a classical plot experiment replicated three times. You see them all the time. 
And for the cereal fungicides, we just apply a single spray um, at a quarter, half, a full, and twice the labelled dose rate. Now, that isn't to say we think farmers should be doing that on farm. The reason we pick those rates is purely for statistical plotting of the dose response curves. We apply, as I've already said, at T1, growth stage 31, 32, targeting leaf 3, or growth stage 37, 39, targeting the flag leaf, except for the Rambularia spray, which goes on later because it's a later um, developing disease. The all seed rates are slightly different. Um, they're applying something more um, similar to a commercial program. So we've got two sprays of foam and two of light, of light leaf spot. And sclerotinia, we apply a single spray in sclerotinia. Doses are slightly different. We go for a quarter, half, a three quarter, and a full label dose. And that's because if we go above a full dose, we start to get PGR effects with some of our products. And even at a full label, in some trials, we see a significant PGR <coughs> effect uh, and um, a reduction in yield at those high doses for some products. So the output from those trials, the wheat and barley traditionally has been done by dose response curves. And I'll just go through these curves a little bit just to aid your interpretation of this is, this is the main output you will see from this project. So what we have is um, disease of the, on this axis, in this case septoria triticide, it's percent disease on the leaf. And across the bottom axis, we have percentage of full label rate. So we have a full, full dose up to a double dose. And for those of you who are scientifically minded, you might say, where are the statistics on these curves? Well, we don't put statistics on the curves, and there's a, there's a reason for that. Um, we have multiple trials over multiple years, and once you start trying to put statistics on those, it becomes very complicated very quickly. And we're not doing a scientific um, research project here we're about what's going on on farm. And so we think the statistic, statistics just clutter the picture. So how do you interpret these curves without statistics? Well, if we look first of all at these two curves, the blue curve and the brown curve, which is uh, proline, pathiconazole, and ignite, epoxyconazole, if you look at the two curves, they're quite similar. Um, you might say that the, the proline curve is a little bit lower at a double dose. So are they, are they the same or are they different? Well, you can help, help for interpretation, you can look at the points. Here we have, at this point here, a quarter dose. Ignite is, is, is performing better at a quarter dose. At a half dose, proline is performing very slightly better. At a full dose, proline is performing slightly better. And at a full dose, sorry, ignite is slightly better than at a full dose. Proline is better. So you can say that the points are swapping around, the lines are very similar. Those products, if we put stats on there, you probably wouldn't pull them apart. And that's what we'd think in the field. Prothiacol, prothiaconazole, and epoxyconazole against septoria, you'd expect to perform fairly, in a fairly similar way. If you look at these two lines now, the, the yellowy orange line and the dark blue line, um, Imtrex and Vertisan, two straight SGHIs, the lines are slightly further apart, so you might think oh, we're looking at something that might be more different here. If you look at the individual points, the, um, the dark blue points are all below the orange points except for the full dose. And if we put some statistics on there, we could pull those lines apart. All the points are different, the lines are clearly separated, so there's a small difference there. So these two are slightly different. Clearly these, this, these two here and these two here are quite different. But if we look at the graph on the left, a slight word of caution, if we look at the blue, line compared to the black and the red. You can say the black and the red, we certainly couldn't pull those apart um, with statistics. They look exactly the same. With statistics, we could probably pull the adexa line, the blue line, apart. It's about all the points are lower, the lines are clearly separated, certainly at the lower dose. But you have to also look at the, uh, what disease level you're looking at. If we look at, heart, at a quarter dose, we're talking about 1% difference in performance. When you're talking about very small differences in performance, okay, we could say they're statistically different, but it, is it actually meaningful in the field? And when you're talking about very small differences, you need to start, start thinking about the cost of these products as well. So that's what you'll see if you come to our agronomist conference. If you look at any of our hard copy publications, you'll see something slightly different. First of all, the dose rate only goes up to 100%, only goes up to a full label, because we don't want to encourage people to think they can put more than a full label rate on. And we take the data points off, um, simply to avoid clutter, because we tend to put more lines on these, on these graphs. So that's what you'll see in our, our hard copy on our website. Um, although you will see HDB rather than HGCA now, of course. Um, but if you want to see the full dose response, you need to come to the agronomist conference. That information goes into our two information sheets, um, fungicide performance in wheat and barley. In addition to the curves, in those you'll find our star charts. We call them our star charts because they used to have stars on them. Now they don't. They have numbers on them. 
a subtle change. And what this is, it's a quick reference guide to the performance of different actives. So here we have um, our different actives. If we pick the S uh, azol SGHI mixtures, so you have epoxyconazole, um, plus isopyrozam, um, fluxoperoxide, epoxyconazole, prothiaconazole, bixofen. So if we pick aviator at the bottom, prothiaconazole and bixofen, we have its performance against different diseases. So we, have, we give it a four, five is the highest rating, five against septoria, four against yellow rush. It's a quick reference, guys. It's not really meant to provide you detailed information. What it is, is if, you, if you've got a situation where you've got a disease you're not quite sure, you don't really deal with very often, you're not quite sure whether the product you're applying is going to be active, you can look at this sheet and get a quick idea of whether it, it's going to be of any use to you. The other thing you'll find on, that, um, on those information sheets is seed treatment. Um, but that's taken straight off the label. It's, we don't do any seed treatment trials. So this, again, it's just a quick reference guide um, for you or your growers. So that's the um, cereals output. The oil seed rape is slightly different, or has in the past been slightly different. The cereals output, as I said, we tried to get out of the agronomist conference in December. Um, we do get out of the agronomist conference in December. The oil seed rape is slightly different. We try and get out that out as soon as possible to try and inform the early sprays in the autumn. Um, when we get out, exactly depends on how quickly we can get the data processed. This year it's a little bit later because obviously the, the season's a little bit later. And that goes out on our website. Traditionally, the oil seed rape has been done slightly differently. It's been done not at a full dose response, but it's just at half and a full dose. And it's, it's produced these kind of gr traditional sort of research bar graphs with statistics on. Um, but we've decided to change that, and indeed we have changed the, the oil seed rape now. It now uses the wheat barley model with four doses, and it'll be presented as curves rather than bar charts. So these are still around. You'll still see these, and they're easy to interpret because they're a standard sort of, of, of graph, bar chart graph. Um, but we are moving now towards um, the curve model for oil seed rape as well. So the key points for fungicide performance. It provides independent information on key actives. It's the building blocks for program design. We're not interested in programs. We don't do programs. Plenty of other people do those. It's your building blocks for those programs. And it's updated annually. As I say, the serials data comes out at the Agronomist Conference. The Aussie data comes out a little bit earlier. And then it's available on our website and via hard copy publications after that. The other piece of work I'm going to talk about today is our fungicide resistance work. There's an awful lot of risks to fungicides, the fungicides that growers employ at the moment. We've got EU legislation, which are removing actives. We haven't lost many yet, but there's certainly a threat to remove some of those. Water framework directive, endocrine disruption categorization, hazard criteria are all likely to cause us to lose actives. And we could lose quite a lot of actives in coming years. We've also got a slowing of, of new actives arriving in the market. And that's because it now takes around nine or ten years and 250 million euros to bring a new active to the market in Europe. Obviously, that's a massive investment for an agrochemical company, and so they're only pushing actives which they're pretty certain are going to make it through all the hurdles, all the toxicology tests, all the efficacy tests. So we've had, seen a, a significant slowing of new actives coming to the market. We've also seen growing resistance of some pathogens to fungicides. Uh, particularly septoria, we've also seen slight changes in light leaf spot, rhynchosporium, ramularia, mildew. We've all seen resistance building in these to the products we've got. What that means is we've now got fewer options to control disease. So we have to try and preserve what acts we have still left. We can't do very much about EU, EU legislation apart from writing letters to our MPs. We can't do very much about new actors arriving. The only thing we can really change as growers and agronomists is, change, is slowing down the development of resistance to the actives we've got. And that's where our work focuses. So what are we doing more specifically? Um, basically, this is research. Obviously, with some knowledge transfer on the end of that. Um, we're monitoring shifts in azole performance against septoria. This is really the big news story in resistance in, against fungicides over the last 10 years or so. We've seen a big increase in resistance to septoria um, over that period. We're also doing work on SDHI stewardships. This is a new, rel relatively new group of fungicides, very important for septoria control. We really rely on these now. So looking at the impact of dose, number of applications, mixing partners, and how that impacts on development of resistance. 
We've also got work looking at the impact of fungicidal seed treatments on selection. So if you apply a fungicidal seed treatment, is that driving resistance as, in the same way that it would be if you're applying a foliar fungicide, or is it some way different? And finally, looking at the effect of variety resistance on selection. So if you use a, a resistant variety, is that helping to slow resistance to, to fungicides, or actually making no difference at all? As far as industry engagement is concerned, I've always already said we engage with the industry um, via the fungicide performance work. We also sit on the Fungicide Resistance Action Group. That's a, a group of um, combines academics and also the industry, the chem industry. We get together and try and decide what's going on um, with resistance and how we can best manage it. Because obviously the agrochemical industry doesn't want to lose their products um, to resistance either. So we put a lot of money into looking at declining azole performance against septoria. There have been reports of decline or lack of control from azole fun group of fungicides against septoria for a long time now. Our fungicide performance work provides quite a, a useful long-term data set to look at that, and I'll talk about that in a, in a moment. But also we put quite a lot of money into um, monitoring change in the CYP51 gene, which the azoles target. The gene produces a protein, the azoles lock onto the protein, stop it working, and that's how the fungicides work. So changes to the gene cause changes to the protein, we stop the fungicides working. So this is data from our um, fungicide performance work, and this shows um, control of septoria by epoxyconazole, which is an Ignite and lots of other products, um, from 1995 to 2013. And this is in the protectant situations. This is when the fungicide is applied before infection happens. If you look on the graph on the left, the half-label rate, you can see back in the early 90s, you were able to get 80 to 90 percent control of septoria in a protectant situation from epoxyconazole. If we move forward, this graph only goes to 2013, but we've seen that pretty steady decline now, and we're looking at about 60 percent control. If you go to a full-label rate, the decline hasn't been so severe, but we have seen a decline in control even at full-label rate. The situation is very similar with the other leading azole against, um, against septoria, pathiconazole and proline. Again, a very similar decline in performance. Um, the decline seems to be faster at a half-label rate. But what has really been dramatic is the decline in performance in an eradicant situation. So this is where the infection has already occurred before you apply the fungicide. If you go back to the early 2000s, in an eradicant situation with both um, opus and proline, epoxyconazole and prothioconazole, they're both in the same graph here, um, bl in blue and the open triangles. You could get 80 to 90 percent control at a full or a half label rate with these products. We have seen a steady and quite precipitous decline in the performance of these products now. We're only getting 20 or 30 percent control. Indeed, in one trial this year, we got zero percent control. Um, in, a, in an eradicant situation, obviously on a, on a susceptible variety in a very difficult condition. But what this means now is you cannot chase septoria with azoles. They just don't work in that situation anymore. Or they don't work effectively in those situations anymore. Now, this is a slightly scary slide. It actually conveys quite a, similar me a simple message. I'm going to go through it um, quite slowly, but. So what we have here is I've already talked about the SHIP51 gene. And all these numbers here convey different mutations in that gene. So if you look at this one here, Y137F, that's a single mutation in that gene. So all these numbers here are different mutations. What we have on the left-hand side is isolates. This is individual septoria disease isolates that have been isolated from leaves from ones that were isolated between 2000, sorry, 1994 and 2008, and then a group isolated later on. And what you can see is the early group had very few mutations. This isolate only had one. We see an increasing number of, of mutations within a single isolate over that time period. If you move to a slightly later period, we get more and more and more and more uh, mutations in that single gene in a single isolate. If we come down to the bottom here, we've got eight mutations in one isolate. So what does that mean? Well, if you go look on the right-hand side, what we see here are four different um, azole fungicide, epoxyconazole, prochloras, tebiconazole, and prothioconazole. If you look at this so-called wild type with no mutations, you need very low concentrations of those fungicides to kill it in the lab. This is a lab test. 
And as you move down, we see more and more mutations. We see higher and higher concentrations required to kill it. So we go from orange, some from green to yellow to orange to red. If we look down here in this point here, we need 3,586 times more epoxyconazole to kill that isolate in a lab test than we did the wild type. And that's why we've seen the decline in efficacy of azoles. And since 2014, if that wasn't enough, as well as those mutations in, in the CYP51 gene, we've seen new mechanisms of resistance to azoles developing. Again, a lot of data on this slide. I'm going to just pick out two little bits, relatively simple. So we've got different strains, strains, isolates, they're all the same thing, people use different terminology. What I want you to look at is strain 2 and, stra and this one, which is actually a French strain. If you look at the mutations in the CYP51 gene, they're all the same. So that one's the same. Same, 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 same. Until we get to here, strain 2 has this thing which we're calling efflux. All our cells, all the cells in plants, have little pumps on the surface which pump things in and out. Well, one of those pumps is an efflux pump which pumps toxins out of the cells. So and that's one of the reasons why a lot of herbicides don't work anymore. But it's also happening in, fun in, in fungi in response to fungicides. So this strain 2, which has this efflux pump, is now more resistant. So if we look at the different um, fungicides and the difference between state, uh, this strain here which doesn't have the efflux pump and this one here which does, it needs 10 times more, 10 times more, 10 times more, 5 times more of those fungicides to kill it in a lab test. So we see this new mechanism appearing um, and having a big impact. But this strain not only does it have efflux pump, it has a mutation in the gene which SDHI fungicides target. What effect has that had? Well, if we look at Bixofen now, you need five times more Bixofen to kill that isolate than you do without that single mutation. Well, you may say, this is all very interesting, very academic. What's it got to do with what I do on farm? Well, because we now understand a lot more about resistance, how it relates to gene changes, what we can do now is we can go into the field, and we, we're doing this, we have research programs doing this, we can apply a treatment, for instance, mixing two fung different fungicides together and see how it changes the mutations, so how it's changing resistance. So an example, we have a, a particular mutation which gives uh, resistance to tebiconazole. We can apply a treatment and find out if that, make, if that gene gets more frequent or, change, or, or gets less frequent. So we can look at different treatments and how they drive resistance or not. So it's having practical implications on, on what we do or what we advise to do on farm. So how do we slow azole resistance? Well, you'll be pleased to know the UK has a more pronounced decline in azole performance than anywhere else in Europe, apart from Ireland, who have even more disease than us. That's because we have high disease pressure. We use azoles a lot more than they do in, on the continent. Although, interestingly, in 2014, in Denmark, they saw the first significant shift in azole performance against Septoria. What we know now from our work um, on, this, on looking at the different mutations and how they're driven, we know that resistance for azole is driven mainly by the number of applications. So the more sprays you put on of azole, the more exposure to the pathogen equals more selection. The small shifts that you get in resistance from each of those mutations means that dose only weakly affects selection. So you can ramp up your dose of azoles and have very little impact on development of resistance. But if you apply two azoles instead of one in your program, that will drive resistance. Excuse me. So if you're using an azole at a T0 and a T3, in addition to the core T1 and T2 timings, that's driving resistance harder. It's driving the population to a more resistant population. Any further additional sprays, T1 and halves, T4s that we've seen in recent years, 2014, people are applying five, six sprays onto the, That's driving resistance harder. So what can you do about it? You need to think about applying things other than nasals. In some cases, there aren't alternatives. You're applying a head spray to control for zerium. You've got very little option. But there are other cases like T0 for rust control, strobilurin, T0 chlorothalin instead of an azole. There are alternatives. So what about SDHIs? Uh, the Fungicide Resistance Action Committee, which is the 
AgChem group classifies SDHIs as medium to high risk of resistance with a high degree of cross resistance. What does that mean? It means, as with azoles, resistance to one will give resistance to all of them. Pretty much, there's some slight variation around that, but pretty much cross resistance. We have seen field mutations in net blotch identified in 2012, 13, and 14, and I haven't heard anything from the 2015 um, yet, but I'm assuming they're still there. They're becoming more widespread and more complex. So far in the UK, they have not affected field performance, but in Germany, um, they have seen field performance affected by S mutations to SGHI and net blotch. We've seen the first uh, field mutations in Septoria um, in 2014, and I know there are more um, in 2015, they're more complex. So far, they're not affecting performance, but things are starting to shift. Data from trials work indicates that selection for SDHI resistance, unlike for azoles, is likely to be driven both by dose and by the number of applications. So the more you put on and the more often you put on, the harder you're going to drive resistance. Tank mixing two SDHIs is not an anti-resistance strategy because, as I said, we get cross-resistance. And use of solo SDHIs, they are on the market, people are selling them. Um, you can argue whether that's a, a sensible thing to do or not, but using them on their own without a mixing partner, and we know people are doing this, is a suicidal strategy. It's going to give resistance, and we absolutely have to hang on to this group of fungicides um, to control septoria because at the moment there's nothing coming down the pipeline from the agrochemical industry. So some general principles. Mixing fungicides of different modes of actions reduces selection for resistance. Um, alternation of fungicides with different modes of action also reduces selection for resistance. It's not as effective as using, mixing them at the same application time, but it does help. As I've already said, alternating and mixing um, azoles and SGHIs, um, I chemicals from the same group, has little effect. And you need to think about your multi-sites. We really bang on now about using multi-sites, um, chlorothalonil, uh, particularly, and also Folpet. They've been on the market, or they've been around for 40 years, and because of the way they work, and it has to be said that we don't understand fully how they work, no resistance has been identified to those chemicals. So we can apply those to protect our other chemicals, um, protect our STHIs, protect our azoles, um, without worrying about resistance developing to them. And actually, if you look at chlorothalonil now from a fungicide performance work, um, and, uh, and lots of other work that other people are doing, Chlorothalonil in a protection situation, it only works in a protecting situation, is now more effective against septoria than prothiaconazole and epoxyconazole. We've seen that develop in the last couple of years, and it's cheap, so it's growers like it. Um, as I've already said, if you're using azoles, high rates, because that doesn't drive resistance and you need it for the efficacy now, you need those really high rates. Um, and minimal SDHI rates, so you can drop the rates as low as you can and to maintain um, performance to reduce the development of resistance. Septoria eradicant activity of all the actives is now weak. As I said, you go back to the uh, uh, late 90s, you could apply an azole in an eradicant situation and expect to get 80 or 90% control. We have nothing that can do that now. The azoles have declined to 20 or 30%, the SDHI is 50 or 60%. We so if you're chasing disease, chasing septoria, you're not going to catch it. What that means now is a lot of people are saying you should front load your fungicide programs. Traditionally, you would load your fungicide program on the flag leaf, on that T2 spray time, because that's your key yield development in wheat. But what we've seen in, in recent seasons, 2012 and 2014, when we had very high disease pressure, if you didn't get control of your fungicide, of septoria early on at that T1 timing, you could, people never caught it up because we can't eradicate it once it's established, or we can have very weak eradicant activity. So think about front-loading your programs, go hard at T1, and then you can decide what to do at T2. If it turns out to be a low disease pressure year, you can ease back at T1. And if it stays a very disease-intense year, like we've had recently, uh, you can then go hard at T2 as well. And consider cultural control options. We don't very often hear about cultural control options um, for, for diseases, but variety, obviously, Simon's talked about variety. Think about those more resistant varieties. And things like sowing date and seed rate can also have an impact on development of diseases. And we've got some work looking at that now and, not, and how that affects the economics of growing crops. With our declining um, group of fungicides and declining activity of some of those fungicides, can we use those cultural options um, to help reduce disease. 
So as far as fungicide resistance is concerned, key point of our work, it provides new information on resistance, tells you how it's developing, and through our perhaps more academic, esoteric work, we can figure out what are the best ways of, control, of combating. What could you change as far as, your, as the, of the programs you're recommending, the way fungicides are used to slow down that development of resistance and hold on to those key products that we have. A way to keep up to date with that, HDB events, I've already said, um, the Agronomist Conference is where the, the key serial um, fungicide results come out, our website <coughs> and our newsletters. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you. <coughs> well, after that rather scary picture has been painted, um, do you have any further questions for Paul? I'm going to kick off with one. Um, you showed us the graphs of azole decline um, in terms of efficacy. Is that what's likely to happen with the SDHIs um, if we see resistance emerging, or is it likely to be more catastrophic? I think if you go back four or five years, what people thought would happen with the STHIs was something similar to what we saw with the QRIs, the strobilurins against septoria. We'd see a very rapid and, and sudden decline in performance. What we've seen so far is more akin to the azoles. Certainly with net bites, we've seen a number of mutations and each stepping up the resistance very slightly. So I think we're going to look more, uh, more like an azole. We have, there are people who have produced lab mutations, so you, which have quite high resistance, but they're very specific uh, mutations. There are lots and lots of other mutations which confer a degree of resistance. So I think we could get quite big steps, but it's going to be a step change rather than a sudden one year it works, next year it doesn't like we saw with QRIs. Okay. Any other questions? Certainly a lot of food for thought there. Um, and I think a lot of work for you guys to be doing going forward. Um, clearly, the management and conservation of the chemistry that we currently have available is not going to be a straightforward job. Um, so uh, it's going to be something that's going to require quite a lot of active thought, active consideration. <coughs> <coughs>